Welcome to the NWR Communications Near Term Resources Conference. My name is Kerry Stevenson, and I'm delighted for our next speaker, who's a keynote speaker, Karina Bader. She's an analyst with the Next Gen Resources Fund, and we're going to go over what Karina sees as the exciting things to look for as we go into what we both see as an exciting time for resources moving forward. Karina, thanks so much for joining us. Let's, uh, let's uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, very happy to be here, and I look forward to um, sharing the Next Gen Resources Fund with your listeners. Uh, I will highlight that it's a wholesale fund only for wholesale qualified investors. And this is our disclaimer slide, which all investors should read before making an investment decision. Uh, so look, who is Acorn Capital? Just for those of you, your audience, who may not be aware, Acorn Capital has been investing in microcap resources for 20 odd years now. Uh, it was actually founded by a, a mining executive and former resources analyst called Barry Fairley, and his view uh, was that there was a very high level of inefficiency in the microcap market, which ultimately means if you know what you're doing, you can make outsized returns. And our track record at Acorn Capital over 20 years supports that thesis. Uh, moving on to the next gen fund, uh, Acorn has been investing in resources for 20 years of its history, but what we did decide to do in September 2020 was set up the Next Gen Resources Fund, and that was on the back of inbound demand from uh, investors looking for a specific resources and energy vehicle. Uh, we have a very extensive research team, so whilst um, I've been at Acorn for 12 years and Rick Squire joined uh, Acorn just under a little over six years ago, We've got a large investment team who helps us in the background with all the administration and operational aspects of the fund. So today we're going to talk about um, the Next Gen Resources Fund and, and its overriding philosophy and where, where it's looking to invest. So what we recognised at ACORN was that there is a tr global transition underway to a low carbon economy. Uh, now, what that means is that there's uh, an increased demand for the commodities required for electric vehicles, energy storage, renewable energy uh, technologies, and that in particular encompasses commodities such as lithium, rare earth, nickel, copper, cobalt, graphite, and most of those commodities sit on the critical minerals lists of a lot of Western countries across the, the globe. Now, in particular, we've got rare earth elements. Um, they're used in the high strength magnets for wind turbines and electric uh, vehicles. There's actually very few producers of rare earth elements outside of China. And those companies require downstream expertise in processing to produce the product quality required by the end customer. There's two types of geological deposits generally referred to for rare earths. One is ionoclase and the other is carbonatites. Now, traditionally, what most investors will be familiar with are the carbonatite deposits. Uh, in the Western world, and they do have some material handling issues for their waste products such as uranium and thorium. However, China is the biggest producer of rare earths in, on the planet, uh, and most of their rare earths come from what's called ionic clay deposits. Now, interestingly, over the last six to 12 months, Australia, there's been a number of companies in Australia who have actually identified ionic clay deposits in Australia. That is giving investors here an opportunity to be exposed to rare earth elements through an ionic clay processing route, which we believe is materially cheaper and shorter time frame than the more traditional carbonatite deposits. Yep. We've also, we also invest in lithium, which is used in rechargeable batteries. Again, over the last 12 months, you've seen quite a lot of consolidation in that sector. The Galaxy or a Cobra merger to produce Orchem, uh, Pilbara buying the Altura assets out of administration, and those Existing producers actually have really strong development pipelines. They've got internal expertise. They've been producing these products for a long time. And because they're producers and have cash flow, they actually have access to cheaper costs of capital. Now contrast that to the developers that are out there on the ASX. They are looking at developing lithium from quite unique ore bodies that haven't been developed for lithium before, such as clay-hosted lithium, uh, predominantly in the US, lipidolite, uh, deposits or through using a uh, processing technique called direct lithium extraction. Now, whilst direct lithium extraction has been used for copper production previously, it's actually never been tried at a commercial scale for lithium production. So there are a number of com companies that are out there um, 
in the Western exchanges who are looking to implement that technology. But from an investor point of view, it's important to be aware that's new technology, hasn't been proven at commercial scale yet. So we believe that there are some pitfalls potentially there for investors in the short term. Uh, nickel, the other core commodity used in electric vehicles, predominantly it's used in steel production, but as the number of electric vehicles grows globally, we will see a larger proportion of that going into the battery packs that go into electric vehicles. Now, there are actually not a large number of nickel producers on the ASX, uh, and often they actually have some impurities, which makes it the processing route difficult and challenging, or their product may not actually be suitable for battery production. The quality and the specification required by battery producers is extremely high. Uh, again, there are two key deposits that produce nickel, traditionally called sulphide deposits or laterite deposits. They actually have completely different capital requirements to get those deposits into production. And again, investors need to be aware of the, cup, the, the size, the quantum of that capital, and the length of time to get some of those laterite deposits into production. So, Karina, just to interrupt you there for a moment, going back to the sulphide or laterite, are, are, you, are you more swaying towards a sulphide deposit type? Type of deposit. Absolutely. The, the product that's produced out of the sulphide process is readily um, refined into a battery quality spec. The challenges are there aren't many of them individually on the ASX. Um, we've seen a couple of all, a couple of them are looking to get into production in the very near term, Panoramic and Mincor. But beyond them, there's actually no other nickel developer looking to get into production. There are explorers, there's quite a lot of explorers. But no developers. Yep. So it's actually a difficult space to find the quality investment. And you will have seen, your investors will have seen that the, um, the panoramics and the Mincor have actually had a strong re-rate over the last six months. Mm. Cobalt is another commodity that is in high demand for battery packs that go into electric vehicles. Now, the issue with cobalt is it's often a byproduct of other commodity production, such as nickel or copper. And the metallurgy can often be uh, problematic. And again, that results in some complex metallurgy. You may also not get the, the payability on your cobalt that you would expect. Um, and so if investors are specifically looking at investing in cobalt, you need to be aware of the underlying deposit that the um, asset is and how much and what type of cobalt it holds. Uh, in addition, globally, the largest producer of cobalt is the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And that can be challenging from a supply um, diversification point of view uh, for the customers who are looking to buy that cobalt product. Copper is more broadly available, um, but it's generally produced from a few large porphyry uh, deposits. And again, similar to nickel, there's very few small producers that you can actually look to invest in on the ASX. Uh, and often they're in polymetallic mines, which means that they're produced alongside things like lead or zinc or gold and silver. And again, the payability for the copper may not be 100%, depending on that metallurgical route. So again, investors need to be aware what their underlying asset is and what it is that they're investing in. Now, another one that Kerry and I were just talking about earlier is graphite. Uh, again, there are a number of companies on the ASX with graphite assets. However, what you'll see is now producing a battery, uh, a graphite concentrate into a, a sort of intermediate market is actually problematic. China, again, is the largest producer into that market. So most of the uh, developers and the existing one existing producer on the ASX are looking to go downstream to produce an actual anode quality product that goes directly into batteries. And that's how they get the economics to work out. Uh, again, investors need to be aware it's not going to be as simple as iron ore mining where you dig and ship. Uh, you really have to be understanding that that processing route is going to involve a down several downstream processes and the real economics are in that downstream value add for you as an investor. But of course, it takes longer, uh, it requires more capital and uh, there actually isn't really a deep pool of skills and expertise in the Australian mining industry yet for that type of processing. Karina, so, yeah, um, I know we're going to do most of the questions at the end, but I thought I'd just throw this way. I've just had a question come in. Uh, and if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A and I'll attempt to get to it. Um, someone's just asking about Blackstone, which is uh, the ASX code BSX for, for nickel, because they've got, of course, the project in Vietnam, but they're doing the downstream value add as well. Exactly. And uh, whilst that is 
again, going to, I mean, I believe that the market is going to need that product coming to market. I would just caution investors that that downstream processing route is very untried. Uh, you've got a team that has never done that before. And again, the, the skills generally in the mining industry in Australia for that downstream processing is quite limited. So you're in a jurisdiction which is challenging from um, a remoteness point of view. Uh, they've never done this downstream processing before. However, they are close to their market, which is most likely to be Japan and Korea. So that does yeah. give an advantage to a project like uh, Blackstone. But I would argue that the capital requirement for that downstream is probably an area that investors need to be aware of. It's not going to be as simple as sort of a 200 million odd CapEx to get the mine up and running. There's going to be additional capitals in the order of three or four hundred million dollars. Thanks, Karina. So just to wrap that story up around these um, rare earth or these critical minerals, whilst the reason we believe that they're going to stay in, in strong demand over the decade is really to do with the fact that the processing route for these commodities is complex, does require large amounts of capital and can often have a range of complexities, whether it's the permitting and processing study timelines, the processing complexity, the large capital requirement, long construction and commissioning periods, all which leads to rather long payback periods compared to, say, investing in a gold mine, which I know Kerry will uh, be happy to hear. <laughs> There's often higher operating costs because of the reagents and different uh, inputs required to get that downstream processing route working properly. Uh, and often, even despite that, you'll still be sending your intermediate project uh, product into China for further refining into that battery grade specification. So it's quite a complex supply chain. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts for all of those commodities, uh, which is why we'd say that investors need to be very conscious of some of those risks when they're looking to invest in those commodities. Yeah, well, I think we should be doing it before we get into gold. I think we should be upside, uh, up up processing, if you like, here in Australia. That's what we should be looking at. Upskilling down here, instead of sending it off to China, we should be saying, all right, what can we do here in Australia to get the skill set so that we don't have to send it off and that we can create that value add here within, within Australia? And that's a very good point, Kerry. And you do you have actually seen the federal government recently issue some um, grants to companies to do exactly that. And really, you see now the federal government has put out a critical minerals investment plan uh, and they have started to look at Kalgoorlie as a battery technology hub and you're definitely oh, wow. starting to see the gravitation of that downstream processing route taking shape. So Linus are bringing home their cracking plant from Malaysia. Now, whilst wow. that's a de-risking strategy because of the uranium byproduct or the waste material, what you'll also realises when she does that, and when Linus does that, they can actually double the size of their finishing plant in Malaysia. So by bringing that cracking part of the processing route back to Australia, they can double their end production for their customers. So it's actually Very a material change for that company and for Australia, I might add. In addition, you'll see more downstream nickel processing through whether it's BHP or Western Areas, which has just recently been bought by IGL, although that's yet to go be finalised. Um, but there's definitely, uh, IGO previously has developed a sulphate process route. Uh, and I imagine that the, uh, you'll see more about that over the, the coming year or so as they consolidate that asset. Um, so you are definitely seeing Western Australia become a hub. As I mentioned, there are a number of rare earth discoveries across Australia, and they're actually geologically, uh, well, geographically dispersed. So there's some have been discovered in Western Australia, some have been mm -hmm. discovered in South Australia on Victoria, uh, on the border there, and we're starting to see that potentially even there are some up in Queensland. Now that's in addition, so that's the ionic clay deposits, in addition to what we already have around carbonatite deposits that have been in development for a long time, like the Arafuras and the Hastings um, companies. But it's the ionic cl clays that are easier to process easier to extract and ultimately as you said earlier the the end result is a lower capex to to get these rare earth elements out yes uh, you will produce a, a carbonate mixed pro carbonate product which will then need to be further refined but the capital requirement you'll be doing like a heat leach operation on those ionic clays which is a much lower cap capital requirement compared to the high temperature high pressure uh, cracking processes that linus and other 
carbonatite deposits require. Um, and so, yes, your, your capital requirement will be lower, the time to production will be lower. You will, however, need to send your product to a third party unless you're willing to develop that downstream part of the process. Uh, the other advantage that uh, Linus will have is the potential to uh, look at processing third party ore through that plant in Kalgoorlie. So again, that's actually a slightly different dynamic that you're starting to see within Australia, uh, the ability to process different deposits through single processing technique. Um, so I think we're gonna see that time. evolve over the next uh, two to three years. It's not there yet. Um, it's still being built and uh, it's expected to be in place by 2025, which is still um, two to three years away. Fantastic. Well, listen, we're going on, as everybody knows, I'm a gold nerd. We're going on to my <laughs> favourite commodity, Karina, gold. Look, I think we've all seen how it's um, gone to new highs in recent weeks, uh, ostensibly on the back of the war in, in Ukraine. Um, we are a big believer in the equities part of that piece. Whilst the gold price has gone up, you haven't seen the equities go up with that gold price. So the, the companies are making more margin because the gold price has gone up. However, the caveat on that is we have also seen inflation rising. We are yet to really see how that impacts on the margins for these gold companies. And I suspect that's what's sort of holding back the equities on gold in, in the short term. But I think as that inflation eases, definitely you've already started to see the oil price come back off and oil price and energy costs are a significant portion of costs for gold miners. Uh, I anticipate that in the coming quarter, you'll start to see an improvement back in those margins. And what I'm um, assuming from that is you will start to see those equities being further in demand. Longer term, uh, I, we still believe that the gold price will stay up lower, you know, higher for longer. Given the, the ballooning government debt globally, um, that uncertainty hasn't changed. You're still also seeing lockdowns for COVID in China. Uh, you're still seeing restrictions in other countries like Japan. Uh, so COVID's not over. It's still going. No. Uh, and we're certainly still seeing some impacts on that supply chain and, and lockdowns globally. And that's why I think you're going to see medium term, the gold price will still stay high. Um, and, and of course, as I'll show later in the presentation, we always have a strong proportion of our investment in gold for that very reason. Good to hear. Uh, associated with, and as I just mentioned, we've seen a massive increase in the oil price in the last few months. Again, on the back of the war in Europe uh, and the global instability that that's brought and the talk of sanctions and cutting off Russia's supply. Um, however, underlying that, we still see that whilst demand globally has come back to sort of the pre-COVID levels for oil and gas, what we haven't seen is the supply come back to where it was pre-COVID. There was some real um, supply destruction during the COVID downturn in 2020 when the price essentially went negative. Uh, and what we're seeing is the producers of oil are really struggling to bring back production back to the levels it was pre-2019. Uh, so we still see that the likelihood is whilst you may not have oil prices peaking, depending on how things play out in Europe in the short term, over the medium term, that the price of oil will stay high for longer, um, purely because there's, there's a limited supply of that uh, coming to market. In addition, in order for company, countries who have stated net zero positions for 2050, we believe uranium has finally been recognised as a... Uh, a, a way of reaching those emissions targets. And you've seen, again, the uranium price has risen strongly over the past 12 months. And again, NextGen is invested in uranium uh, stocks as well. Now, something that investors might be looking at or have heard recently are things like uh, hydrogen, which is being promoted by governments and other uh, entities as a viable pathway to decarbonisation. However, at ANCON, our view on hydrogen, it's more a longer-term story it's more, it is not yet at commercialisation stage. The current technology to produce hydrogen is not economic with the other renewable sources of energy uh, in the marketplace right now. However, post 2030, we believe it may very well become economic to start implementing hydrogen solutions in the energy market. But there are a range of ways of producing hydrogen. And as you can see from my picture there on the left, there's seven different types ranging from green to brown. Obviously, green hydrogen is considered uh, green because it's produced from renewable energy, whereas brown hydrogen is considered uh, fossil fuel driven electricity, electricity generation. 
Now, what we like to talk about is the opportunity for NextGen to invest in different commodity mixes, as we've just described. Where do you go in the ASX to find opportunities of that nature? When you look at the ASX top 100, you're essentially looking, you're investing in bulk commodities. And you do have a little bit of EV in that space, 11%. You've got opportunity to invest uh, in the precious metals at 10%. And again, another 10% roughly in energy companies. However, when you look at the market that NextGen invests in, we've got a much larger pool of companies uh, across a much broader range of commodities. So you can see on the right-hand side, 30% of our investable universe is in battery metals. The other roughly 30% is in precious metals, but we've got a higher opportunity in energy at 20%. Uh, we've got direct the ability to invest directly in uranium companies, and then also 13% in other, which is made up of lead, zinc, uh, potash, phosphates, mineral sands, and tin commodities. But it's not just about the commodity split, it's actually the number of companies that you can invest in. When you look at the ASX 100, there's only 17 companies that you can invest in in resources and energy. Conversely, if you look at the uh, outside the top 100, which NextGen invests in, but more than 10 million in market cap, we've got over 600 companies we can choose from. And so we believe we can actually uh, be invested in different commodities at different company stages of development, which give us an opportunity to make outsized returns. And how we work that out is using this chart, the Lassonde curve. Uh, what you can see on the x-axis is project advancement of a company from left to right. Uh, on the y-axis, you've got the stock valuation, which roughly on the left, you'd expect it to be investing in a company roughly around 10 million market cap and a junior explorer. Whereas on the right-hand side of the chart, you'll be investing in a producer with roughly about a billion dollar market cap. But what you can see is there's two peaks, there's two opportunities to make uh, money in this uh, cycle for these companies um, through that cycle, through the exploration stage and then into the production stage. However, whilst Lasson defined those company stages into three categories, exploration, development, production, at Acorn Capital, we break it down into nine different stages and we invest, invest across all those nine, um, or have an opportunity to invest across all those nine different stages. And what you can see in the middle of the chart there is our asset allocation to those different development stages. The majority of our funds are invested in that expansion stage of development, whilst the next largest cohort of our investment is in the early exploration stage, and we have a smaller allocation to that development stage Investors do need to be aware at that development stage that there can be a loss of value, mainly due to the fact that now companies have to go through the permitting process, which is dictated by governments and the timeframes are uncertain. They're going through metallurgical studies to determine what the best processing route is to extract the minerals. Uh, and they're also going through all the, the economic studies, drilling out their deposit, defining the real economic uh, extent of their deposits, all of which takes capital and time. So usually that valuation falls because you really have an extended time period, it can be anywhere from two to five years in this stage, and the company needs to raise money throughout that process. It's very difficult to get debt at that stage because it's unclear yet around the economics, and debt providers don't tend to want to invest at that development stage. They'll invest once you've completed that stage and you're looking to actually build the mine and you've got all your definitive studies completed, uh, your off takers locked in, uh, your economics and your metallurgy is defined, that's when the banks will actually get involved. Now, this is uh, the Next Gen Resources Fund as of uh, the end of February last month. And as you can see, 35% of the funds, the majority of funds there are invested in uh, battery metals. But if you include that with copper and uranium as the renewable facing commodities, you'll see that over 50% of the Next Gen funds are invested in renewable facing commodities. We've still got that 24% in gold, Kerry, you'll be happy to see. Uh, and then we've had an increase in weight in energy over the last 12 months, predominantly due to the increase in those commodity prices. And then we always hold a portion of cash to take opportunities of capital raises or new um, investments that come through. In the bottom chart there, you'll see that uh, the majority of our funds, 44%, is invested in that expansion stage of company development. The next largest investment stage is the exploration stage on the right, uh, left hand side of that chart. And then we still have about 20% of our funds invested in that early stage three. And that's where companies have their feasibility study. They're literally ready to go to FID. 
they're working on their debt, they're working on their off takers, and then they need to raise their capital to get the mine into production. Now, what we know when you invest in the companies that we invest in at, ACO, at NextGen, the companies we invest in will have impacts on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, things like affordable and clean energy, producing sustainable in communities and cities. We do have an impact on poverty. Uh, we also impact on climate action. Uh, and in, in particular, our companies do provide decent work and economic growth in the communities which those projects are based. Now, this is the, the important slide. Uh, since inception at uh, Next Gen Resources, which was oh. September 2020, we have, uh, if you look at the top line and the top table there, we've outperformed all relevant benchmarks since inception. Uh, so if you'd invested $50,000 back in September 2020, you'd be now sitting on over $80,000 in the Next Gen Resources Fund. This is a list of the top five companies we currently have in the portfolio by alphabetical order. And you can see that it's quite a mix between the battery metals, copper, gold, and we've got one oil and gas producer in the portfolio. So thank you uh, for listening. And um, again, I'd like to reiterate that we are a wholesale only fund and I'll hand it back to you, Kerry, for questions. All righty. So ladies and gentlemen, ask away for, to Karina if you've got some questions. Karina, uh, before they get too excited, I'll just ask you quickly, energy prices, are going through the roof and you know you've got one oil and gas in that top five but do you see that impacting uh, I, I guess not just the profitability but the way you will look at investing in certain companies as those energy prices don't look like they're going to be coming down anytime soon you know we've got inflationary challenges as well so that that sort of cost of delivery of, of projects is going to be challenging. I think that's correct. Uh, and where I think you'll see that in the main uh, is in the, the cost of capital to build projects. So if you're an existing producer, yes, you're going to see some margin compression on the back of those energy price increases. However, we saw the price of oil peak up at about $120 a barrel US, um, but you're actually starting to see that that's come off from the peaks. Uh, there will be short-term volatility, but I think over the sort of short to medium term in the next six to 12 months, you'll start to see that it will likely ease from where it's been, uh, barring another black swan event. Um, you know, we're not macroeconomists at Acorn Capital. What we do believe is we look to companies uh, from a bottom-up point of view. And if I go back to my Lausanne curve, what we're looking for is where a company is transitioning or in a stage of development where we can see that there's a return to be made. An explorer who's really drilling holes to find a, a, a discovery, that's where you're gonna get a, a return on your investment. We're also looking to invest in those companies where predominantly the resource is defined, they've completed their study, they've got their mining license and permitting. So we are investing uh, for those catalysts as opposed to making a call on any particular commodity where it's gonna be in 12 months. So whilst costs and inflation are having an impact, um, you are seeing the commodity prices are going up as well. And because we believe that, that those commodity prices are going up, not just because there's a demand pull, it's actually because there's a supply shortage. Yeah, when there's a supply shortage, the price has to keep going up. Yeah. So as long as the price of your commodity continues to go up in excess of your inflation, there's still a margin to be made for those companies. Karina, I could talk to you for the next two hours because you are a wealth of information, but we've run out of time, which is really oh. annoying. Uh, <laughs> Karina, thanks so much on, on joining us on NWR conference today. Great to see you as always, and I, so much information to take in. Uh, this um, presentation, I'm sure, will be up either with NWR or with Acorn Capital very soon. Karina, great to see you, and we'll look forward to chatting to you again soon. Thank you very much, Kerry. It's a pleasure to be here.